Well, before we start in the message, I just want to take a minute. Tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day. The day that we as Americans, we honor the men and women who have died while serving in the U.S. military. For many, it's just a day off of work, maybe a good day for a barbecue or a party or there's a sale at your favorite store or go watch a boat race. But I want us to take a minute to reflect on those who have fallen, those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for America's freedom, and to pray for their families. Tomorrow, this Memorial Day, I encourage everyone really during your your busy day tomorrow to take some time just to pray for the families of those who have been lost and reflect and honor the heroism of the soldiers who have died in the past and all those who are currently serving America. My wife and I, we have a son in the Navy. He's right now out in the Mediterranean or somewhere. America, it's it's the home of the free because of the brave who protected and God. So let's please pray. Let's lift up those individuals who have fallen in their families. Father in heaven, we just come before you. You are in control of all, and I just lift up for those who are currently serving, Lord, that you keep them out of harm's way. We just ask that you have your angels about them, Lord. And for the families who have lost a loved one, Lord, just comfort. Just comfort, Lord. We just pray that your peace comes over them. We thank you that you are in control. And we give all of this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 For those here this morning in the sanctuary, or if you happen to be listening by our radio station or maybe online through kcgp.us, or maybe you're watching the live stream, YouTube, Facebook, you're sitting here. I just want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel, Grants Pass, where we really do, we try to go deeper in the Word, deeper in prayer, where we study, we read the Bible line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter and book by book. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. John 18, we're going to start in 28, verse 28. I'll give you a couple seconds to get there. I apologize. I have somewhat of a cold going. By tomorrow, my voice will be my, hey, my bedroom voice. How you doing? (laughs) John chapter 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Verse 31. Then Pilate said to them, You take him, judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. 
Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We pray just for moving of your spirit amongst us, just to hear from you, God. We want to hear from you, Lord. By your spirit, touch us, speak to us. In the name of your son, in the name of Jesus, amen. In today's passage, Jesus, having been arrested the night before by the religious leaders, hoping they can get rid of Jesus once and for all. See, they hated Jesus because he spoke truth. Jesus spoke truth. He called them out on their hypocrisy. And also, he calmly stated that he was equal to God equal to God, and that the kingdom of heaven went through him, Jesus. His own words in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one gets to see the kingdom of heaven unless you go through me, unless you believe in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They, the religious leaders, they didn't like that. They didn't want to hear that. To them, that was blasphemy, and only death would do. So after a quick conversation with the political, the religious leader, Honest, which yielded no new information to Honest for which he could accuse Jesus, that conversation we covered last time was verses 19 through 24 in chapter 18. Honest, since Jesus bound to Caiaphas, the official high priest, for the official Jewish trial. Now, unlike the other Gospels, John omits the exchange between Jesus and Caiaphas and the whole Sanhedrin. He doesn't, John doesn't even go into that trial, but goes to directly to Jesus being sent to the Roman governor for what the foes of Jesus, honest, Caiaphas, and the majority of the Sanhedrin, they hope is a death sentence. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So the first question is, what is the praetorium? Well, derived from the Latin word praetor, which means leader, the praetorium was wherever the Roman emperor or governor representing the emperor, the emperor was staying or was headquartered, whether it be his official residence or a battlefield tent. The official residence of the Roman governor of Judea was the port city of Caesarea. So that residence typically served as his praetorium. But when he was in Jerusalem for official business, or maybe just to keep an eye on the rowdy Jews during one of their most festive festivals, he stayed at the palace of King Herod, which was adjacent to the Roman garrison at Antonia Fortress, located on the Temple Mount. It was on the northwest corner of the temple area, and it was referred to as the Praetorium. This structure included a hall, an area where the governor would convene for judicial matters. Hence why in some of your Bible translations in this verse, instead of Praetorium, it'll say Judgment Hall. So why take Jesus to the Praetorium? Though the Jews were under the authority and control of the Romans, Rome allowed the Jews to police themselves, to govern themselves as long as they were civil and peaceful. The Jews were judicially ruled by the Sanhedrin, which consisted of 71 religious political members. <clears throat> and this group of 71, they decided all judicial matters of the Jews throughout the land. 
Think of them as like our Supreme Court. They had the final say. But by Roman decree, the Sanhedrin was not allowed to inflict any capital punishment, meaning they couldn't sentence a man to death on their own. They needed Rome's help. All deaths had to be sanctioned through the Roman governor of the region. So Jesus was taken to the praetorium because that's where the governor was staying. And the religious hypocrites, they needed the governor's approval for their devious deed. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. They, in the verse, meaning the Jews, the religious leaders, representatives, and the temple police. Remember, the arresting party of Jesus, it consisted of Judas the betrayer and the servants, the representatives of the high priest, and a unit or a cohort of Roman soldiers. When Jesus was first led to Annas, the Roman soldiers, they left. They went back to the barracks on the Temple Mount. Judas, he sunk back into the shadows to deal with his conscience of betraying an innocent man, the Messiah. And after the mock Jewish trial before Caiaphas and the whole Sanhedrin, the Jews, meaning all of them, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the crowd, they all took Jesus bound to the praetorium. But verse 28 states that they wouldn't enter. Why? John, with an ironic touch, shows the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. To eat the Passover, a Jew had to be absolutely ceremonially clean, had to be thoroughly washed. Now, if they had gone into Pilate's headquarters, they would have incurred uncleanness in a double way. Two different ways. First, the scribal law said the dwelling places of Gentiles are unclean. And second, the Passover was the feast of unleavened bread. Part of the preparation for it was a ceremonial search for leaven throughout one's home and the banishing of every crumb of leaven because leaven represented evil. Leaven represented sin. To go into Roman headquarters would have been to go into a place where leaven might be found. And to go into such a place when the Passover was being prepared was to render oneself unclean. The hatred of the Jews of Jesus made them lose all sense of proportion. They were spiritually blind. See, they were so careful of ceremonial and ritual cleanness that they would not enter the Roman headquarters, yet they were busy doing everything possible, everything in their power to crucify Jesus. Their meticulous concern for physical cleansing was in complete contradiction to their intent to unjustly condemn and slay the Messiah. <laughs> they were so careful to make sure that they were physically clean, yet because of hatred and jealousy, they were spiritually filthy. They were unpure, unholy. Hatred and sin will do that to you. It will blind you to the truth. Concerning the Jewish ritual of removing the leaven in the home, the kids loved it. It became a game, hide and seek. The parents would hide a little bit of leaven, and then the kids would search and seek, hide and seek. Still part of the festival today. But it was meant as a spiritual application to purify one's self, to search and to get rid of leaven, sin. The religious leaders were so steeped in religion ritual their spiritual eyes were blind. They couldn't, they wouldn't see their hypocrisy. Pride. The evil one, Satan, kept them in sin so that they didn't hear the truth, so that they didn't see spiritually the truth. 
and they stayed in darkness, not recognizing the true light of the world, Jesus. And in all honesty, are we any different? So often we fuss about the littlest trifle. Here at church, we don't like this or that. We get it all in a huff and then we break God's law of love and forgiveness. We get all bent out of shape and become caustic, judgmental because things are not done the way that we think they should be. Or if somebody offended us, God calls us to love. We are all flawed. We have to recognize that and just seek the forgiveness of Jesus. Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, to examine ourselves to see if there's any leaven, if there's any sin in our home, in our hearts. And if so, not to be a hypocrite, not condone it, but realize what it is. Sin is sin. We need to deal with it. We need to acknowledge it and repent. Turn from it and turn toward God. Turn. Turn. Toward Jesus. Also, here in verse 28, there seems to be a confusing situation, a controversy. Earlier in John, we read that Jesus and his disciples ate the Passover meal. Now, all Jews were to eat of the Passover meal on the day of Passover. But here in verse 28, it seems that these Jews, these religious leaders, had not yet eaten. Did Jesus eat the meal earlier than he was supposed to? And if not, why hadn't these Jews, being the religious leaders, eaten the Passover meal? Well, there's two theories that both seem plausible and can work. First of all, it was lawful for the Jews to eat the Passover meal any time between the evening after sunset before the Passover and that day of the Passover. See, this was necessary due to the large number of lambs which were to be killed for that purpose. 30 years after the life of Jesus, there was a census taken. There was over 256,000 lambs sacrificed for Passover. So it was a time factor. Jesus and his disciples, they could have eaten their Passover meal the night before Passover, before sunset. A second theory is the word for Passover is Pascal. The word is used in three different usages. Sometimes the word stands for the Passover sacrifice, the actual lamb itself. Luke chapter 22, verse 8 and verse 13 support that. Or it can actually denote the actual meal, the whole Passover meal. Hebrews eleven twenty eight. 28. But also is the case that the word can refer to the entire eight-day festival or feast. Maybe given their mindset, the religious leaders, they didn't want to defile themselves at any time during the feast. We know from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is God-breathed, correct, and free from error. So either way, verse 28 states that they didn't enter the praetorium. Now, again, John does not detail the trial of Jesus before the high priest in the Sanhedrin. But by, by the time Jesus is rebound and sent to the Roman governor, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, he has been ridiculed, spat on, demeaned, cowardly beaten, falsely accused, tried, and given a death sentence, all by his own people, the Jews. Having already condemned Jesus in their Jewish trial, now the Jewish authorities give him to Pilate to examine and ratify their sentence. Though they were ceremonially clean, little did they know that Christ was the true Passover lamb and they were about to kill him in that capacity. Verse 29, 
Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate. For those who do not know, Pontius Pilate, he was the Roman governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36, serving under the emperor Tiberius. He is believed to have hailed from central Italy. He's mentioned in all four gospels and also by the Roman orator Tacitus, the Jewish philosopher Philo, and also the Jewish historian Josephus. In addition, the Pilate stone a stone discovered in an archaeological dig in 1961 and dated AD 30 includes a description of Pilate and mentions him as prefect of Judea. In 26 AD, the Roman emperor Tiberius appointed Pontius Pilate prefect of the Roman province of Judea. The typical term for a Roman prefect was one to three years. Pilate held that post for 10 years. As a Roman prefect, Pilate was granted the power of a supreme judge, which meant that he had sole authority to order a criminal's execution. Pilate then went out to them. He goes out to them. Why? Well, partly he understood their dedication to their laws. They were fervent. They were not going to come in. Now, he could have ordered, he could have demanded that they come in, but I believe he was a little afraid of them, of them stirring up trouble. See, he only kept his position as governor if there were no riots, no uprisings. If there was a rebellion in his region, Rome would hold him liable. So I believe he wanted to appease them. By bringing Jesus to him, Pilate knew that the religious leaders, the Jews, wanted Jesus put to death by crucifixion. So first he goes out to hear the Jewish authorities. What accusation do you bring against this man? What has he done? Verse 30. They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. The word evildoer, in some of your translations, it'll say criminal or malefactor. It means someone who is guilty of crime. Not guilty of a crime, guilty of crime. The word denotes a pattern of evil, one who is actively engaged in evil. Wow. Like Judas betraying with a kiss or the temple officer hitting Jesus in the face. Now these Jewish leaders call Jesus evil. The hatred for Jesus. Mike was just telling me that yesterday he was down at the, the festival, the boat nick, and he was out there just telling people that Jesus loves him and the hate he got. People just come up to him and just start saying stuff. They don't even know him. The hate for Jesus. How foolish we are as men when we hate Jesus, when we callously lump Jesus in with the rest of the world, with the rest of the religions. With their actions, these religious leaders, with their words, they slandered the Son of God. Jesus, who healed the sick, given sight to the blind, cast out evil spirits, fed thousands, raised men, from the dead. He had taught the truth about God in miraculous ways. And they, the religious leaders, searched his life for any flaw and found none. In the end, 
they were forced to hire false witnesses to lie and testify against Jesus. Note that these leaders, that they do not say or list the crimes in verse 30, just that they wouldn't have delivered Jesus if he wasn't a criminal. When Pilate asked them for the crime, they seemed to have been taken by surprise. They were irked that Pilate didn't take their word for it. Don't you trust us? We wouldn't have come, we wouldn't have delivered unless he was guilty, unless he was criminal. Though Pilate knew they were bringing a capital case to him, without giving him a reason, Pilate, he plays it safe and puts it back on to the Jewish authorities, back in their court. Verse 31. Then Pilate said to them, you take him, judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Though the religious leaders were dogmatic in following their rules, their laws, they didn't hesitate to cite Roman law when it suited their purpose. Per your decree, we are not permitted to kill anyone. Those are your rules. That's why we've come to you. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. These men, these religious leaders, those who were supposed to know the word, They had forgotten an important prophecy which they were now helping to bring to pass. Old Testament scripture stated that Jesus was to die by being pierced. Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they pierced. The religious leaders were also <laughs> proving Jesus a prophet. In his own words, Jesus earlier had said in John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Being lifted up, meaning crucifixion. That was a Roman method of execution. The Jewish method was stoning. They would stone. They would never crucify if the Jews had executed Jesus, it would have been by stoning, not crucifixion. This whole incident was sovereignly overruled by God. God is always in control. Remember that. Verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Throughout John's account of this Roman trial of Jesus, God incarnate. Over the remaining of this chapter and the next, Pilate, he will go in and out of the praetorium repeatedly. First, outside to hear the Jews demand the ratification of their death sentence. Verses 28 through 32 of chapter 18. Inside to hear Christ's own testimony to his kinship, his kingship. Verses 33 through 38. Then back outside to make his first declaration of Jesus' innocence and to offer a choice between Jesus and Barabbas, verses 38 through 40. Then back inside for the scourging and the mockery of Jesus, chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Then back outside 
for his second declaration of Christ's innocence. Chapter 19, verse 4 through 7. Then back inside to examine Jesus about this frightening, amazing accusation of the Jews that this one here, Jesus, claimed to be the Son of God. Verses 8 through 11 in chapter 19. And outside, finally, for the capitulation before the Jews in the shameful miscarriage of justice. Chapter 19, verses 12 through 16. Pilate, a man, seemingly unsure of what he is doing, unsure of his actions, unsure of the truth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But because of his pride, he was unwilling to see. Reminds me of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. So that no longer we might be infants being tossed by waves and being carried about by every wind of teaching and the cunning and the craftiness of men with a view to the scheming of deceit. This formal examination initially of Jesus by Pilate. Chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. It revolves around five questions. Five questions that Pilate asks Jesus. First, the salient, most notable question. Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 33. Second, The scornful question, am I a Jew? Verse 35. Third, the serious question, what have you done? Also verse 35. Fourth, the sobering question, are you a king then? Verse 37. And finally, the speculative question. Verse 38. What? is truth. Pilate asking Jesus, what is truth? Questions and answers. Questions and answers. Sometimes people ask questions that have obvious answers. Is the Sultan Sea really salty? No, I've never been there, but yes, it is. It is 25% more salty than the ocean. Does the sun set in the west? Yes, we all know that. Is a large chocolate strawberry malt from 31 flavors fattening? (laughs) I know firsthand, a resounding yes. (laughs) Other times, people ask questions already disbelieving. The answer to come with a hint of sarcasm in their voice. My old cronies who knew me back in the day. Troy, you really go to church now? (laughs) If I told them I was a pastor, they'd probably... (laughs) There was sarcasm in Pilate's voice when he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? See, Pilate, he'd been around for a while. He was well aware of past false claimants to the Jewish Messiah. Men who would come along every so often to claim deity. To him, Jesus was just another one of those, just another guy. He didn't really believe that Jesus was the king of the Jews. This showed in his answer when Jesus asked if he, who he was asking for. Was he asking for himself or for the religious leaders? See, Jesus wanted to know if he, Pilate, was serious to know the answer. Was Pilate serious to know the truth? Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? 
Am I a Jew? He was saying, why should I care who you are? I'm not a Jew. I don't have need for a king, a spiritual Messiah. I'm Roman. I have Rome. I have Caesar. See, Pilate wasn't serious about what Jesus was claiming. Pilate was not serious about spiritual truth. Questions and answers. We ask questions to get answers. And to get the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. Right questions give us right answers, which gives us right knowledge. But then, what do you do with that right knowledge? What do you do with it? Earlier, Pastor Kevin had said that God is wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is the belief and application of that truthful knowledge. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if it's not truthful knowledge, and or if you don't use it, it's not going to do you any good. It's useless to you. It doesn't do you any good. Today, today, you have heard truthful knowledge, not my words, but the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way to see the eternal kingdom of heaven, and that is through believing in the blood of Jesus Christ, that he came down off of his throne in heaven, came down to this cesspool, and lived humbly, lowly as a man, and then willingly went through all of the pain, all of the suffering, and the separation from his Father in heaven for you, for me, to die for our sins. Let me ask you five questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior? Amen. Two, for you, those in here, or if you're listening on the radio or watching online, do you really want to know about Jesus? Third, what are you going to do in your life with that knowledge of who Jesus is. Four, will you allow Jesus to not only be your Savior, but also your Lord, your Master, every single day of your life? And five, will you believe in the truth of Jesus. What is truth? It is God. Jesus. Every single word that Jesus said was truth. This is truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for this love letter to us, that through it we can get to know you better, Lord. That we can get to know your son, Jesus. I thank you, Father in heaven, for sending your son. And Jesus, I thank you for willingly going to the cross out of obedience to your father and love for us. You went through all of that, all of the pain, all of the suffering, so that we could have eternal salvation, that we could have an eternal life with you, Lord. Right now, I just have to ask if there's anyone 
in here or listening that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and would like to, just slip up your hand if there's anyone. If you're not sure where you're going, if you were to die today, no one is guaranteed tomorrow. Scripture says salvation is today. Today is the day of salvation. If you're listening and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, or you're not even sure, you don't know, but you want that eternal salvation. You want to know where you're going. Just slip up your hand. If you're listening on the radio or watching, I can't see, but God does. That's all that matters. God loves us so much he gave us his son. Father in heaven, we come before you. I just pray by your spirit that you move on people's hearts. Soften hearts. Show us what we need to cut out. How to get rid of that leaven in our lives so that we can be closer to you, that we can have fellowship with you. I just pray by your spirit to convict those who need convicting of sin, to comfort those who need comforting, who are going through a rough time, to encourage those who need encouragement. Lord, we all need encouragement. I just thank you for who you are. We pray this in the name of your son, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have a couple of the pastors up here, myself. Please, if there is anything you would like to pray for or have us pray for you, be it financially, physically, mostly, spiritually, whatever, do not leave this building without doing business with a God. God bless.